Hello, everyone. I'm Jeremy Geffen, Executive and Artistic Director for Cal Performances, and it is my great pleasure to have with me today Caleb Teicher, dancer, choreographer, and company leader, and pianist and composer Conrad Tao. Uh, this will be Caleb Teicher's uh, debut at Cal Performances, and Conrad, this is actually the second time you've appeared at Cal Performances, but it, it, in a very different sort of project. So I wanted to ask the two of you, um, first of all, how you first encountered each other and how this project, More Forever, was, uh, was born. I'll take it. Um, yes, uh, as you said, Jeremy, this will actually be my second time uh, in Berkeley uh, under the auspices of Cal Performances. Uh, my debut was way back in 2008 um, when I was, I know, I know, when I was 14, um, I made my recital debut at Zellerbach. Um, and it's really, it's wonderful to be back. I've been in Berkeley as well with the symphony, but it's so great to be back doing something uh, with Cal Performances. Um, well, Caleb and I first overlapped and interacted and, and, and most importantly, like just became aware of one another in, uh, in 2011, exactly 10 years ago. And we were both, that year we were both uh, finalists uh, at Young Arts Week, which is put on by the National Young Arts Foundation and uh, the National uh, Foundation for the Advancement of the Arts is a uh, youth arts program that recognizes uh, hundreds, like over a hundred artists, high school aged artists in many different disciplines. And all of us were together in Miami for a week um, that year in that January. Um, and so we were both finalists that year and, and over the course of that week saw each other perform. So that was our first point of contact. Um, and then we, after that point, we were, I think that, I think that that week, first of all, was pretty important to both of us um, as a really intense and joyous space in which young teenage artists were all flung together. And maybe for me, the most powerful effect that it had was that it um, showed me that, that there was the possibility of working with artists uh, in uh, peer artists who were working in different disciplines than your immediate one. And so I think that's a core ingredient that led to us building this together many years later. We, after 2011, we were just both young artists based in New York City, and we were both making our, forging our paths, and we just became friends and uh, became closer friends and started going to each other uh, to each other's shows and then pretty organically out of that uh, Caleb approached me they approached me in like 2017 uh, with a sort of germ of an idea for a longer evening length work and it really just started there super organically and Caleb was it was it clear? for for you as well that the two of you would have a trajectory that would intersect yeah uh, yes and no um i mean i was a fan of comrades right away but i don't think i i don't think i was aware of how we would fit together um artistically i just i just really appreciated what comrade was exploring and the way that he was exploring it um and I think uh, in 2013, we had a chance to work on a very short piece uh, together that Conrad composed for piano, cello, uh, electronics on an iPad and tap dance. Um, that was sort of a, a, a particular piece for a particular occasion. Uh, but I, even after that, I didn't say, oh, I think, I think there's a, a, whole, a whole sort of multidisciplinary piece within that. It, it, I think the the collaboration really came out of our desire to spend time in the room together um, and through wanting to be together and wanting to expand our 
sort of artistic horizons together, we found a, a sort of vehicle that worked for that. Um, I think our, our first couple conversations about this project, we're just trying to understand how our different idioms would fit together, how our different disciplines would fit together. Um, and I, I would echo Conrad's statement that going to Young Arts uh, was really uh, mind expanding or mind opening for me because I had not really thought that, uh, that tap dance uh, or percussive dance or Lindy Hopper, these things would work with contemporary music or classical musicians in general, or, or um, I, I wasn't really thinking at, at that scale yet. Um, so it was really nice as a teenager to, to sort of have my mind blown a bit and then to have my mind blown in the same room as Conrad and say, wow, you know, this is, this is now a sort of a peer group I have. Um, and, and Conrad, th this collaboration is really unique because Conrad and I have sort of shared every labor together. It's not a sort of conventional choreographer composer relationship. I don't know if there is one, but I imagine if there is a conventional choreographer composer relationship, it's the composer gets asked to write a piece of a certain duration and then the choreographer makes the piece. Um, and, and there's less back and forth. There's less shared time in a the studio. There's less chance for a composer to give feedback about the trajectory of the choreography and vice versa. Um, it really, it really was a shared labor and, and there, there are very few lines to demarcate where, uh, where Conrad's contributions, uh, begin and mine end, etc. So, so in that way, it's, um, it's, it's pretty special. It, you know, you actually anticipated uh, my my next question, which was uh, about the the difference between choreographing uh, uh, an existing uh, musical work as opposed to chore uh, choreographing something that is either new or may not have existed prior to. Um, you're entering the studio, so that I'm I'm sure that that made for a, a much uh, a longer process. Um, uh, yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's like building a world. Um, you know, you could do anything. You could you could do just a few things, and and out of those choices come infinite possibilities, or then very clear choices that could be made. I mean. When Karma and I first talked about this project, we weren't sure whether or not uh, electronics would be involved alongside acoustic piano or if acoustic piano would be involved at all. Um, no less different kinds of keyed instruments, no less different kinds of uh, dance that makes sound. In this, in this work, we do uh, what, might, what might be called tap dance, but we're doing it on sand. Uh, which has a particular sort of sonic texture. And then we're doing Lindy Hop, uh, or we're doing uh, sort of partnered jazz dance forms like swing dance um, on sand, which also has like sort of a new, just like a new sort of environment to work in or a new texture to work in. And all of these choices affect Conrad and all of Conrad's choices affect us. Um, so there's no sort of like happy ignorance, like, oh, you know, Conrad's just gonna play some stuff and we're gonna do some stuff. Everything is really like, has to has to share space and has to share uh, sounds. Um, yeah, it's. I think at this point we know each other's parts, so to speak, really quite well. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I would say that for me, uh, it was a new experience to work over uh, in such an intensely collaborative way and over a long time scale. Because uh, usually my experience as a composer is super solitary. Um, you know, you busy yourself with writing notes and then you um, you bring it, you send it to an orchestra or to an ensemble if it's not yourself. And and you it, it, it's a very different process oftentimes in concert music. Um, and so this was really uh, luxurious to me. I, I love I, I thought it was so um, it was really luxurious to work in such an open ended way. Um, to be able to create simply from uh, from like the germ of an idea. The only thing that I would say that we knew from day one was like the existence, the, the presence of sand. Uh, that was an initial constant and an initial idea that remained a constant. And then um, a general feeling, a tone, um, a, 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 an emotional feeling that um, 
that was very hard to verbalize, but that we really fleshed out uh, in that first meeting, a kind of lyricism, a kind of lightness, um, and, and also an interest in seeing if one could access that feeling of lyricism uh, and softness, actually, through uh, some unexpected means, uh, means that were maybe often more read as percussive and dramatic and virtuosic, but perhaps not always delicate and nuanced and subtle. Um, and so that was that was like just one early goal that we set for ourselves, but that's it. And from there, it was really just, all right, then what happens? Um, and for it was a very uh, joyously open experience. And uh, I, uh, I, I've, I think I learned a lot from it as a composer. And can I ask, um, is, is it, um, what was it about the sound of, of sand or sound or feeling of sand that was, uh, uh, was germinative, I guess? This was, this was 2017. So like, I was thinking about this uh, earlier, like, this was, I think ASMR <laughs> was maybe new to our frames of ref, like it was this, ah, like for me i remember like being so being so obsessed with um with asmr when i first discovered it i think just uh just like it it said something so powerful to me actually as a as someone who loves sound as someone who's a musician it's it was very meaningful to me that somehow there was this deep love and sensitivity to sound. That's what I took away from ASMR writ large. And so I think that probably was one element. I had a, I, I was also around that time getting really into like crackly sounds of like mouth noises and, and, and plastic bag noise and other things that have made their way into other things I've done. So that's maybe one element, but Caleb, I mean, you know better than I do. Yeah, well, I, you know, now that you bring up the year 2017, 2017 was the first year that I started working uh more more frequently with a collaborator of mine named nick garris and nick uh, is an appalachian clogger and flat footer and does different sort of traditional percussive step, step dances from both sides of the atlantic from england and ireland but also from uh, canada and america and um and it was the most time i as someone who had been tap dancing uh you know for a good majority of my life at that point it was the most time i had spent dancing but not in tap shoes um, and by that i mean i was still intending to make sounds but i was wearing leather soled shoes which don't have metal taps and have just a sort of uh just a different feeling a different feeling dancing in them and a different sounds when you dance in them and then by dancing with nick he and i he and i were doing a duo show at that point or had just had just made our first duo show um, he, we would both dance on sand together. And I just found that to be one of the most pleasurable and interesting, and then ultimately sort of bizarre, uh, sort of untapped areas of percussive dance. Um, I think people, uh, are very familiar with the sound of metal tap shoes striking wood. I think it evokes so much historically and presently and, and kind of lights a, lights a fire in us. And I think the sound of leather sold shoes against a, a wood floor and then with sand as a sort of way to create greater texture a la ASMR or a la a sustain pedal because tap dancers usually can't create sustained notes, but with sands you can. There was just all this, there was all this stuff to explore. And I think um, at the time that Conrad and I were shoving off, I just said, I, if we're going to spend a lot of time on something and we're going to try to create a world that feels sort of 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 our imagination, let's give it a, a texture, like a, a a sort of a palette that that sounds like nothing else out there, really. Um, and of course, tap dance is always connected to to its history and its tradition. Uh, and there is history of sand dancing and, and tap dance, but it's usually solo improvisational dancers. This is this is the largest sandbox, frankly, that I've seen <laughs> ever. Usually it's like four feet by four feet and one person standing in place. Um, but to add a, you know, a, a full stage size sandbox and to add a number of dancers that just the, the sort of the, the spectrum of what you can do, the palette of what you can do is, is pretty tremendous. And then add in Conrad, it's just like, it feels a bit like a feast sometimes. And I'm actually, I'm very proud of us for not like, for not overindulging 
uh, and putting too much sound or too much in like it, it's actually the work can be quite quiet and quite delicate and quite sparse, considering that we have all these new exciting sort of instruments or, or uh, tools at our at our disposal. Although on the flip side, I think that I'm also proud that there are um, the dynamic range of the piece is really big. Like, I, I think that uh, there is also um, there are moments where there is actually so much happening at one time and so many layers of activity happening at one time that I think the I, from my perspective, the intent is less to signal uh, or or. Uh, have everyone explicitly notice every single detail that's happening. The, the effect is to produce something total. Uh, so I think that we have that wide range. And actually that speaks like, I wanted to add that something that I think we came to like about the sand over the course of the process is how abstract the sound is, how like really visceral um, the sound is, but also how intensely abstract it is how how evocative it is and um like it's it's specific and not um you there's a lot of different things to hear within it and um in fact like i i remember i've i've actually edited samples of the sound in some recent um revisitings of the piece that we've been doing i've been like editing sounds of sand um and thinking about like what it evokes, if it if it sounds like sand or if it sounds like something else, like it, that that's I think that's a real feature of the sound that it um, that it opens up interpretive pathways. You know, as you both speak about uh, your experience uh, it, it, with this piece, I was thinking about your re relationship to the contact that creates the the piece uh, that you. Um, we think of um, we certainly think of piano as as an object, but it's the 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 touch. It's the the the, yeah, the way that you um, that you actually literally have the the hammer struck, um, and I, I think this piece really draws attention uh, to the way that um, the foot hits or caresses. Uh, the surface, um, which is which is incredibly beautiful. Yeah, and that and that sort of that sort of nuance is is what people can geek out upon endlessly when it comes to percussive dance. That that relationship to the floor and that sort of tone and texture, subtle differences in in texture and tone make all the difference. Um, uh, and it's this it's the same really with every instrument, but particularly because the sort of tonal range of tap dance is not 88 pitched keys. Um, you really have to get really excited about small changes. Um, and, and, and those small changes can evoke so much feeling or so much, um, uh, so much depth, um, not to get all metaphorical with the piece, but I do think the sort of the, the dynamic range of the piece is reflective of just how things feel sometimes, sometimes as comrade was saying, you know, there's sometimes there, there's so much going on sonically and visually you just think oh it's it's overwhelming and then sometimes it feels like there's nothing happening at all and i thought to myself while i was on mute oh gosh isn't that what life feels like sometimes where it's, sometimes it's just it's just overwhelming it's too much stimulus and then sometimes it feels like it's it's a it's a desert or something um especially now yes yeah, so, so <laughs> we we have we have, uh we made this piece before uh before covid covid began um, but I, I do think actually, as we revisited the piece over the past couple of weeks while we were on tour, I thought, wow, I, I, I have a feeling people will read into this piece in a very particular way after the, after the experiences that a lot of us have had over the last year and a half. I, I think that um, we're going to, you know, this is one of the few shared experiences that, um, that, that binds every person on this planet. Um, and we're, you know, we're just having the most immediate reactions right now. I think that it's going to reverberate for, for generations to come. And um, the way that 9-11 defined um, the, the last 20 years, this is probably going to have, have a similar or even greater impact. Um, Caleb, I was wondering if you could talk about what you what you alluded to earlier, the, the, the set 
um, the, the, the sandbox. Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of our, it's our little, it's our little playgrounds, not to make a sandbox pun. Um, but it's, it's the space where we get to play with tone and texture and bodies in relationship to sort of space, but also in relationship to, to our, our dancing and, and how it relates to the floor. Um, it's, it's something that we sort of devised as a, honestly, a great solution um, that is relatively cost effective, speaking candidly, um, but also has a great look and feel and sound um, and is, is kind of is kind of unlike um, any any floor I've danced on, um, because it doesn't usually have that added element of sand. I think, I think a lot of people say that it looks quite fun to see us uh, dancing in the sandbox. Uh, and I th I'm trying to think about other pieces. A lot of Pina Bausch works come to mind, you know, stage that are flooded with water or mulch or what have you. And I think uh, sand is not quite mulch, but there is something quite um, sort of tactile and uh, exciting about it. A, a lot of the dancers have never danced on sand before. Really, actually, most of them before, before rehearsing for the piece have never danced with sand. So I think you see, when you see the work, the excitement of each dancer saying, this this still feels novel to me. I still feel like I'm discovering and exploring each time. Um, and maybe maybe Conrad feels the same way. I think I I think we, we kind of surprise ourselves all the time with with what sands can add to the to the piece. Um, it's and it's not quite predictable either. Like we we can't count how many grains of sand we put on. The floor so then the the tone is different each time and our and it doesn't spread evenly either so there's a lot of there's actually a lot of sort of risk <laughs> involved um but but uh managed risk uh in a way that that feels quite fun yeah I, there's you know everyone's got to leave the stage at some point before each show so that the the box can be cleared so every show quite literally begins with the box tabula rasa and then it ends with like just you know traces of the show all over the place um it's it's great and i love uh, observing from my position on stage the cloud that inevitably gets produced over the course of each show it as as caleb said it's actually kind of it's 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 not an easy thing to bring into a performance space as we have learned uh, the hard way in certain places where we brought this piece. Uh, and so, uh, it, yeah, it's a it's a chaotic element. It's, it, it is actually like bringing in this kind of chaotic element that uh, defines the sound role of the piece. And I think is just, is one of several, but a pretty uh, pivotal and certainly foregrounded element of the piece that demands like all of us on stage be really tuned into um, and listening very hard to what is happening like immediately. Um, the piece uh, is uh, has been really like carefully composed out at this point. It really, you know, the arc is completely set and yet baked into the form of the piece, even the mechanics of the piece are a lot of elements that can only um, make any kind of sense or can only happen if we're all like, paying very close attention to what is happening at that show in that moment. The performance of the piece is like, it is the living of the piece. So I, that's what I like about it. Like you, it demands that you be extremely uh, aware of what is happening uh, with everyone around you. Conrad, I, I noticed that you play multiple keyboard instruments in the piece. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, you know, the decisions that went into to those instruments. I, yes, so yes, I do play on uh, multiple keyboard instruments. Uh, it's a little bit, it's, a, I, I don't want to say too much more because I guess it's technically a spoiler. Okay. Um, but, but yes, I, I mean, I'm also looking around my room right now and there's, I can see four keyboards within like, my, <laughs> within the frame. Um, so first things first, I clearly have a problem. Um, but 
But honestly, I mean, like everything else about the piece, it actually completely grew out of, uh, it grew organically out of just uh, our artist, our creative desires. I, I think, I think Caleb, um, I keep, I keep forgetting, Caleb mentioned that in 2013, we got to make a short piece together. And I also always forget that um, that piece was part of this festival that I put on in 2013 um, uh, called the Unplay Festival, which was like kind of a big, uh, uh, party that I threw in New York like many years ago to, to, to it was like a programming manifesto in a lot of ways when I think back to it um, but on that program uh, was a music by the composer Tristan Parrish uh, who has this uh, great little toy piano trio uh, and uh, Caleb was on that program with the piece that we had the short piece that we had built together that year called Leaves um, and so I think that might have been one impetus because like because I know you were at that show uh, and uh, the pink toy piano was the one that I played. Oh, there's the spoiler. But um, but so I think just out of that, uh, there was just this little germ of an idea again, just like I feel like maybe there's something there. And, you know, the it turned out that it fit into the sound world like a glove. Yeah. And, and not to give too much more away, but I think another thing that we were always interested in, the whole, the whole group sort of had this question the whole time, when does Conrad get to join us in the sandbox? Um, you, know, you know, Conrad's at mission control with, with electronics and with, a, with a, a big piano in front of him, but Conrad is as much a part of the physical world of the piece as any of the dancers. It, you know, he doesn't play in the pit. He doesn't play on the he he is he is in the piece visually and physically and and kind of in all ways that the that the the dancers of the of the group are, um, and so I think there were a lot of conversations about when and how it might be appropriate for Conrad to join our space um, in a in a more direct way, and I think um, thinking about other keyboard instruments like a toy piano, say. Um, was a great way for for us to get Conrad uh, away from from you know his sort of home base without asking Conrad to do a dance solo, which actually I would have loved. Um, and Conrad's an excellent dancer, but um, I think uh, we were we were trying to figure out in what way it felt appropriate to sort of sort of engage Conrad in the sandbox, and and there it was. And, and my, my last question is actually about what it means to um, to make the transition from from being uh, a dancer element, a, a party of one, to creating a a, 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 a company, uh, which you, you've done so well over the past few years. Thanks. I'd like to think so. Um, it's been quite the journey. I actually, I have to, I have to give a big shout out to Conrad here, who really was sort of on board and really believed in the whole concept of this, of this particular project, which is very ambitious, considering that I had like no funding, no presenters interest. You know, there, there was really nothing to this other than uh, an idea that this might be interesting, um, and. Not to say I've come a long way in the past three or four years, but I've come a long way in the past three or four years. And I do feel like now it makes more sense to do a piece like More Forever. But when when Conrad and I first started More Forever, I like I I had I had very little to my name, as it were. Um, and so I, I, it always it always means a lot that Conrad and I got to create this at a time where it felt like anything was possible, and yet it all seemed quite daunting. Um, that being said, uh, my favorite thing about being an artist is working with other people. Um, solos are convenient <laughs> um, because you don't have to schedule rehearsals for anyone and you don't have to worry about paying anyone else and yada yada. But it, it's it's been one of the, the great joys and sort of fulfilling meaningful parts of, of being alive so far to to corral people and, and get a group of people moving towards a shared vision. Um, it's there's a it's it's also been you know it's taught me a lot. I of course have something I'm I want to share with the the people I work with, but they have as much if not more sometimes to share back uh, towards me. And I think if my goal as an artist is to keep exploring and learning, 
um, running running a dance company and and you know creating things with uh, with ensemble work in mind has been like the greatest the greatest school I could have ever gone to. Um, so I, I still do uh, dance by myself, as it were. Um, uh, Conrad and I are most most famously are, are doing a duo show now where it's just Conrad and I, which is quite nice. Um, uh, but but it's it's really special, and I'm sure Conrad can speak to it too. The sort of the group feeling is uh, is quite special, and is is really kind of unlike um, at any sort of solo duo trio quartet gig out there being in a being in a touring company of uh, eight performers and then usually three three on the support team it, it actually it's it's makes such a rich environment for for you as a person to to just feel part of something i love it i spend so much time alone in my like outside of more forever life uh, it, you know so much of life as a concert pianist is solitary so it's a breath of fresh air to be a part of a larger group. It's, it's really, it makes being on the road a lot more fun, first of all. Um, and also, I mean, I, I can't speak obviously to the specifics of like what it's like to really run a company, but what I can say about this collaboration that has also held true for other collaborative work that I've done is one of the great joys of it uh, um, is, is the pleasure of finding your, uh, your common language with another person, um, another artist, your, your share, your common creative language. And I think that that's the pleasure of working with other people, no matter if you're in the same genre or medium, or if you're in different ones. But I think because Caleb and I come from different mediums, um, and not, not only that, but like even within our mediums, I music, them dance, uh, even within those, larger but within those categories uh, we also I come from a classical music tradition and they come from tap dance both of which are you know have long and documented histories in which the history is very important to just the train like we're, we both come from historical forms is what I'm trying to say so and we both come from historical forms with very distinct vocabularies and so in this collaboration um there was a lot of learning from one another, but there was also the forming, the finding of our shared creative language, which was really not just one technical or aesthetic language. Um, it wasn't just jamming our vocabularies together. It felt much more, in some ways, more intimate and more um, uh, simpler, in a weird way, simpler than that, because it was, it was as simple as trying to figure out what was right for the piece. And, uh, and that I think is uh, the greatest thing about collaborating. Well, we can't wait to see the, uh, the result of this beautiful collaboration on the Zeller Bach Hall stage. Uh, and I thank you both so much for making the time. Caleb, Teicher, Conrad, Tao, see you very soon. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks.